Hello again, fellow Mystery Files. Today I will review one of Agatha Christie's gems from the 1930s, Three Act Tragedy, also called Murder in Three Acts, which is celebrating its 90th anniversary of publication this year. It was first published in 1934 and is a Hercule Poirot, although truth be told, the main sleuth here is really Mr. Satterthwaite, who makes his only novel appearance in this book. He is typically found alongside Mr. Harley Quinn and his adventures. As always, with my reviews, I will have a non-spoiler summary mixed with commentary, and this will last until right before the murderer is revealed. I will warn you when the spoilers are coming, and from that point forward, spoilers are free game. Before I begin, make sure you like this video and subscribe to the channel to keep up to date. All right, let's get going, and I will try to keep the summary as brief as possible. My last few reviews ran way longer than I anticipated. But three-act tragedy is divided into, you guessed it, three acts, suspicion, certainty, and discovery. And Christie writes this novel as if it were a play. We even have what appears to be like a very short playbill at the beginning, listing like the costume designer and the director and what have you. It begins, as most Christie novels do, with a spectacular bang. The renowned stage actor Sir Charles Cartwright is throwing a house party in his country home of Crow's Nest in Cornwall. And we get a very like pithy descriptions from Christie of Crow's Nest and Cornwall, where she once again sets a scene as quickly as possible without going into lengthy descriptions I typically skip through. Sir Charles is aging slightly, but he's still very handsome. Women love him. And there's a lot of talk about like, why hasn't he married yet? Is he going to marry someone? Why hasn't he been on the stage in a while? There's even like this little hint like, oh, maybe he's gay and all that sort of thing. We're immediately alerted to something sinister afoot when Sir Charles's housekeeper, Miss Milray, announces that she is going to this party because otherwise there will be 13 guests, and that is an unlucky number. The party is filled with a mix of like theater people as well as some locals. Amongst them are everyone's favorite Belgian detective, Hercule Poirot, and Mr. Satterthwaite. Other guests include Sir Charles's best friend, the psychologist Dr. Bartholomew Strange, Reverend Babington, the elderly vicar and his wife, Hermione Egg Lytton Gore and her mother, Lady Mary. The Gores are somewhat impoverished local people with Egg just absolutely infatuated with Sir Charles. Oliver Manders is our resident young Jewish communist who is in love with Egg, and he is portrayed in very much the way you would expect his character for, to be portrayed in 1934. And to be fair, Oliver Manders' portrayal isn't like as bad as others. Other guests include actress Angela Sutcliffe, playwright Anthony Astor, whose real name is Muriel Willis. Anthony Astor is a woman, not a man. And the final guests are Captain and Cynthia Dakers, husband and wife, with the captain being a heavy gambler, and Cynthia, a well-known though heavily indebted fashion designer. The guests engage in like idle chit chat until Sir Charles decides he's going to make some cocktails, which Miss Milray distributes to the guests. The Reverend Babington somewhat adorably asks his wife if it's okay for him to have his annual cocktail, and when she gives her permission, he takes a sip of the cocktail and drops dead. The guests have a bit of mixed reactions to this. On one hand, it is like a shocking death, but on the other, Reverend Babington was old and not like in the greatest health. His death is largely just like chalked up to natural causes, but it definitely puts a damper on the party. Afterward, a few people voiced their suspicion that like maybe this was murder. In particular, Sir Charles is pretty adamant and pushes the theory that no one just wants to say out loud, mostly because like the Reverend was a nice guy and they don't want to like upset Mrs. Babington by revealing he was murdered. Moreover, no one really can figure out like how he might have been murdered. The cocktails are like the obvious instrument, but no one can see how they may have been poisoned and like the glass he drank from was cleared of poison. Poison. It's all just sort of like brushed under the rug a bit. Like it's still on people's minds, but it's not like really eating away at them. And no one like really is certain it's murder or not. 
Then we fast forward a little bit in time. Poirot is on vacation in the French Riviera as he's old and wants to slow down in life. I think this book really demonstrates the issue Christie had by initially starting Poirot as quite old. I mean, this feels very much like the murder of Roger Ackroyd, where he retired to grow vegetable marrows. And Poirot is bored in France because he has nothing to do. But then Mr. Satterwhite is also in France, as is Sir Charles. What a coincidence. And they read in the newspaper that at a house party in Yorkshire, Dr. Strange dropped dead in very much the same manner as the Reverend Babington did. And like all of the same people are in attendance. Poirot and Satterthwaite and Sir Charles were not present. And like Oliver Manders showed up unexpectedly to this party. In this part of the book, Manders is like clearly the prime suspect as he fought with both Reverend Babington and Dr. Strange. And he's also like the only like young male around, which is typically who the police would look at. Egg writes to Sir Charles and asks him to help investigate because she trusts him, and she's very worried about Oliver Manders. Sir Charles asks Poirot to help him, but Poirot turns it down, just wanting to relax, but he's just so bored, he like gives that up pretty quickly and joins in the investigation. There's a great scene here with Poirot watching a mother and young child on the Riviera, and the kid is just so bored, and the mother tells him to go look at the sea, and the kid comes back in like two seconds later saying, well, he looked at it, what now? And Poro very much sympathizing with his child. Because Dr. Strange was not elderly or ill, an autopsy is performed, and it's revealed he died of nicotine poisoning, which is an unusual poison to choose. More interestingly, however, is that none of the food or drinks at this house party contain nicotine. Reverend Babington has to be exhumed as well because his death was eerily similar to Dr. Strange's, but we don't get the results of that autopsy until later on in the book. Most of the focus here is on Dr. Strange's murder, and Poirot, Satterthway, and Sir Charles investigate, where they learn like Strange had a new butler named Ellis who disappeared shortly after the party. Ellis was unusual because he didn't act like a butler. Even though his work was professional, he was overly chummy with the other help, and with Dr. Strange specifically. One may mentions how Dr. Strange and Ellis laughed about a Mrs. De Rushbridger, a patient of Dr. Strange's, and seems like something like an inside joke going on there. There is a lot of gossip about a secret passageway in Strange's home that never really comes into play, but it's believed Ellis may have escaped that way. The general like feeling is that Ellis was either guilty and fled or was also murdered and his body hidden in the passageway. Because the readers never actually see Ellis, I, I think it's a safe assumption to make that something is up here. This is a classic Christie trick of not relying on what you've been told especially when you have not seen it. And Sir Charles finds some blackmailers that seem to indicate that maybe Ellis was blackmailing Doctor Strange. I think this middle portion of the book is a, quite a bit of a slog, uh, mostly because Poirot is playing second fiddle to people like Sir Charles and Egg and Mr. Satterthwaite. They do all of the work, mostly primarily investigating the other members of the house party. The Dakers are heavily indebted, and their marriage is seemingly on the rocks because of this. Actress Angela Sutcliffe used to date Sir Charles, and she seemingly hates Egg out of jealousy, but I mean, there doesn't appear to be any there there. Playwright Mariel Willis, whom Poirot speaks with, is the most interesting one of this bunch and the most important. The fact that Poirot is the one speaking to her while this while he plays second fiddles, deal with everyone else, is kind of a bit of a giveaway here. I mean, Poirot asks her a lot about Ellis, because Poirot recognizes that Maria Willis is observant, and that other people are unlikely to be paying attention to the help. And Willis says she noticed that Ellis had a weird birthmark that shaped like Australia on his hand, and Poirot suspects she knows more than what she says, but he just like lets it go for the moment. Reverend Babington's autopsy comes back, and he too died of nicotine poisoning. A lot of people find this particularly shocking, although the reader, you know, has been primed to suspect this for some time. Miss Milwright is just absolutely beside herself, which is a little surprising. Like, why does she care so much about him? Poirot and Egg spend some time with Mrs. Babington, and she really can't provide any reason why someone would want to murder her husband. Manders' name comes up, and she even dismisses that. The Lady Mary, Egg's mother, wants her daughter just to hurry up and marry Sir Charles because she thinks... 
Manders isn't suitable, but she's also concerned with her daughter getting involved in a murder case because Sir Charles is involved. A lot of the investigation parts of this book, especially like later on, kind of just like circle around and meander quite a bit. Poirot hatches an idea that he should throw yet another dinner party, and this time have Sir Charles take a drink from a glass and then pretend to drop dead. The idea being that the real murderer would be very surprised at this because it would be so unexpected that they would have like a different shocked look on their face. And Poirot goes through with this plan and Sir Charles fakes his death and Poirot gets what he wants. And we're told pretty much up front what specifically Poirot was looking at. And he wanted to see the look on Muriel Willis's face, which in terms of the reader really elevates her to prime suspect. Poirot also explains he wanted to demonstrate if someone could switch the victim's glass without anyone noticing, which he successfully does, revealing how the murders may have happened, but doesn't really get us any closer as to who. And then, like, immediately after this, sort of af- out of the blue, Poirot receives a telegram from Mrs. de Rushbridger, who is the patient of Dr. Strange, whom he and Ellis joked about, and she claims she has information about Dr. Strange's death. The next day, Poirot and friends rush to the sanitarium where Mrs. de Rushbridger is, and she's unsurprisingly dead, having eaten chocolates poisoned with nicotine in a clear tribute to the poison chocolates case by Anthony Barclay Cox, and yet another Golden Age murder victim who succumbed to eating random food they received through the post. I don't understand how this keeps happening, but it is very entertaining. And chocolate specifically, I mean, we see this in other Christie novels as well. This sort of happens in Parallel End House. Even The Chocolate Box, a Poirot short story, has sort of a similar thing going on. Poirot makes the very quick and sort of obvious once it's told to you deduction that Mrs. Rushbridger didn't know anything at all and was killed to prevent Poirot from learning that she didn't know anything. And I'll get to this in my criticism section more, but Poirot reasons that the poison chocolates had to be mailed to her before the telegram was received, so this was all just nonsense anyway. And I'm going to end my spoiler-free summary part here, so back out now if you don't want to hear any more, read Three Act Tragedy and come Come back to enjoy the rest of this video. We have a little bit more to cover before the revelation, although this part is irrelevant mostly if you're reading the American version of this book. But Egg and Sir Charles have this conversation about names. I believe they are in a cemetery when this happens, and Egg talks about her nickname. Her real name is Hermione, and Sir Charles confesses that Charles Cartwright is just a stage name because his real name is unsuitable for a star like him, and his real last name is Mug. And we then cut to Poirot chasing Miss Milray through the countryside, and he stops her from destroying some poison-making equipment. Poirot gathers all the suspects, as he's wont to do, for a summation gathering, and reveals the murderer of Reverend Babington, Dr. Strange, and Mrs. de Rushbridger is none other than Sir Charles Cartwright, our favorite stage actor. Sir Charles's true murder target was Dr. Strange, not Reverend Babington, who died first. I'll talk more about my thoughts on this in both the praise and criticism section. Essentially, Sir Charles wanted to marry Egg, but he is currently married to a woman in an insane asylum, so he cannot divorce her. Poirot learns this when he looks at marriage records under Sir Charles's real name of Mug. Sir Charles murdered Dr. Strange because he was the only person who knew of Sir Charles's marriage. The murder of Reverend Babington, and this is really insanely clever, was meaningless. It was just a dress rehearsal for Sir Charles before the real thing. Sir Charles is an actor, and actors rehearse. Sir Charles needed to know if he could remove the glass with the nicotine poison in it without anyone seeing, and this is how he did it. When he made the cocktails at the first party, he secretly poisoned one glass and put it on the tray Miss Milray passed around. Sir Charles handed Egg one cocktail he knew wasn't poisoned, and he also knew that Dr. Strange never drank cocktails, so he was safe. The victim was random. Reverend Babington just happened to be the person who grabbed the poison cocktail. When everyone was distracted, Sir Charles switched out the poison glass for a clean one, which is why no nicotine was detected. When he murdered Dr. Strange, Sir Charles was actually the butler Ellis, whom he passed off to Strange as sort of like this practical joke to see if they could get away with it to the other guests. 
This is why the butler easily disappeared afterward and why Dr. Strange was so chummy with the help. Muriel Willis recognized Sir Charles and began to suspect him. When Poirot had Sir Charles fake his death, it wasn't to see the shocked reaction on the murderer's face. It was to see the look on Muriel Willis's face because Poirot knew she thought Sir Charles was the killer and wanted to see how she looked when he, she thought he was dead. Mrs. de Rushbridger was just another murder to distract Poirot, and it fails to do so. That's the official British ending of the novel. In the American ending, Sir Charles's motive is different. He is not married, but is in going insane himself after decades in the theater. His ego was so big, he began to display moments of extreme narcissism and becoming maniacal. Sir Charles fears his friend, Dr. Strange, a psychologist, was going to have him put away for treatment. And this is sort of like really hinted very subtly when Captain Dacre suspects that like Dr. Strange might try to put him away for alcoholism. And this is the ending the Tony Curtis adaptation uses, and it's spectacular there. Although the original British version is the one in print pretty much everywhere today, as far as I know. I know I have like American editions that now have the British ending. And just to wrap up a few things, Sir Charles is arrested, and Poirot essentially gives him this option of suicide or public hanging, whichever best fits with his theatrical persona. The American version has this great ending where Sir Charles tries to bluff Poirot, who just, like, isn't having it. And Egg winds up with Oliver Manders, whom she always cared for, and she suddenly realizes that Miss Milray was trying to smash the poison equipment because she was in love with Sir Charles and wanted to protect him. The very last scene is great, in which Mr. Sathwaite realizes that he could have drunk the poison cocktail, and he's just horrified by this. And Poirot jokes that there's even more terrifying conclusion that Poirot could have drunk it, and it's just like a fantastic final line. Let's get into praise. I praise this book a lot already. I think the concept of the dress rehearsal murder to cover up the real murder, it's brilliant. It's so baffling because there's just no reason for anyone to murder Reverend Babington. And it really nags on your mind, even like before you know he's murdered, because you just know he was. I mean, this is a Agatha Christie novel. And naturally, she's having you look in entirely the wrong place. I always found this plot to be genius and extremely creative. There are flaws, but I'll get into those soon enough. I enjoy the theatrical flair throughout this book. There's this atmosphere of the theater. The book opens like a playbill and lists costumes by Ambrosine, which is Mrs. Dacre's fashion house. And you do get a bit of the feel that you're sitting in a theater watching a play. The first time I read this book, I thought like the big reveal was that none of this was real. And this was just like an actual play starring Sir Charles and Poirot as a guest, and that turned out not to be the case, but nonetheless, I think it demonstrates the writing and atmosphere very well. There's a lot of humor in this book, particularly with Poirot's observations I already mentioned. There are a lot of great clues in this book. It hits all of the boxes of things you would expect from a Christie novel. The ending where Sir Charles is insane is just brilliant, I and mean, you can really feel it on a reread, just how egomaniacal he is. It's not the original ending, but I personally think it's the better ending. My opinion of three-act tragedy is largely positive, but it's not one of the best Christie's. I think it's like the second-tier Christie, and my list of criticisms is longer than my list of positives. I think this is a book much more enjoyable when you just read it. When you think about it and analyze it, I, I think it starts to fall apart a bit. This isn't an instance of the book being like obviously not well thought out like some of her worst novels are. I have issues with Sir Charles's plan here. The way it's presented in the book is that his murder of Reverend Babington is merely a test run for the real thing when he goes to murder Doctor Strange. Fine. However, what if Sir Charles failed? Like, what if someone caught him switching the glasses? What if no one drank the cocktail? What if he lost track of the cocktail and, like, Egg drank it or he drank it? And there's a lot to go wrong here, and it doesn't. And it isn't as if, like, Reverend Babington's death is meant to be obfuscation by hiding the true target. It does do that, but that's not how it's presented in the book. And even beyond that, Sir Charles wants everyone to believe Reverend Babington was murdered, and that doesn't make much sense, and he should be pushing the idea that it isn't murder to make his next kill easier. And then when we have the coincidence that it's the Reverend Babington to get the poison, when he is the exact best candidate for it, 
If anyone else dies at that party, murder is going to be suspected by the police because everyone else is like young and healthy. So the right victim for Sir Charles dies, even though he doesn't think so. It's a clever plot, but it does fall apart on like strict scrutiny here. I think his murder plot to murder Doctor Strange is also problematic. He does run the risk of being recognized as Alice the Butler, which he is, and he also has the risk of Doctor Strange having blab to the and the or the other servants noticing. I mean, Sir Charles is a famous, well-known person. He's not a nobody. And I think his murder of Mrs. de Rushbridger is not ideal. I guess he's just obfuscating, but he didn't really need to do that. It's not like one of those late book Christie murders for padding, but I don't know why this was needed other than to fill the murder in three acts title. A lot of Sir Charles's mistakes do play into his persona as an actor and an egomaniac, but I do think the plot suffers very slightly for it. I think the original ending of Sir Charles being secretly married is not solvable. You can identify Sir Charles as the killer, yes, but you cannot find his motive. There's no mention of Poirot looking into marriages until he just says that happened. And this book suffers from what I think is like an understated criticism of Christie. And I don't hear a lot of people talk about this, and it was on my pet peeve list, but a lot of the characters are just not viable suspects. The Dakers, Angela Sutcliffe, Mrs. Babington, Lady Mary, even Oliver Manders, Miss Milray, Maria Willis. They're not that present in the book. They're barely in it outside of like that first chapter when they need to be. They don't have much going on in terms of plot, in terms of character development. They lack. And I think there are times when this book slows down. In particular, Paro isn't the big character in this book. He sort of takes a back seat to Mr. Satterthwaite, which I like Mr. Satterthwaite, but Paro needed to be present and more of the detective in this book than he is. And let's move on to the individual characters. Let's talk about Poirot. I needed more of him. I liked him when he was present. He was a lot of fun in this book, as I mentioned, particularly when he talks about how he could have been poisoned. But I did feel as if Christie let Mr. Sarathway and Sir Charles and Egg take the stage in this novel. I mean, Poirot is the one to solve the murders, yes, and figure everything out. But he's not like really the one doing the investigation. He doesn't even like interview the Dakers or Angela Sutcliffe. It's Egg doing a lot of that and just reporting back to him which is fine but i mean he's more of an armchair detective here and instead of like actively solving the case Mr. Satterthway is a friend presence. Now, I imagine well over half of the people who read this book for the first time do not know Mr. Satterthway from the Harley Quinn short stories. I didn't the first time I read this book, and he and Sir Charles were my prime suspects the first time just because of the lack of other suspects. But I've always liked Mr. Satterthway. I like how Christie connected the Quinn verse with the Poirot verse. Mr. Satterthway is one of the more like attuned characters in this book. He has the right idea of what's going on. He's really the first and only person who believes Reverend Babington was murdered, and there's like more than meets the eye here. But in terms of like deduction, he doesn't do a lot of the work. Uh, he's cut from all of the adaptations of this book, and you know, you can see why. He's not really needed there, but he is a lot of fun nonetheless. Sir Charles is our murderer in this book, and I have him ranked number 33 of 100 Christie Killers in the top third here. He's a fantastic character, especially in the version where he's genuinely losing his mind. And I criticize his plot, but it's very creative, very fun, and a genius plot. One I don't think anyone will like actually pull off in real life, but as a character, he's great. He's one of the best versions of the killer who enlists the detective to mislead them along the way. Usually the killer is more obvious, but not so much here. Now, Sir Charles isn't like particularly well hidden as the culprit, but that's not because of what he does. It's because of how the other characters are portrayed. I love how his plot is to build into his personality as this grand actor who has to take the center stage in the strange murder. He has to play the role of the butler, making this really the only time in a novel, at least, where the butler did it. Like, technically, not a real butler, but anyway, it counts, in my opinion. And he makes a big to-do about it. And in the Babington murder, he uses it as a dress rehearsal. Even in one-on-one -on -one conversations that acting persona takes over he's by far the best original character in this book and quite frankly probably the best character in it overall 
Moving on to the victims, Reverend Stephen Babington is barely on the page, but I think he made a good impression during his brief stay with us. He's this meek elderly vicar who politely asks his wife if he could have his yearly cocktail, which I thought was a good look into him. Uh, we're told he gets into fights with Manders over religion and just like the generation gap between them. We learn a lot about his past once he's dead, but it's not that important or that interesting. I think it's a bit of an odd choice by Christy to have his murder sort of be the like the secondary one in terms of investigation. We do spend a lot more time focusing on Dr. Strange's death than investigating Reverend Babington's death, which sort of gives away the show that Babington just isn't that important to the plot line. Dr. Bartholomew Strange, Tolly Strange, is our main victim and our main target. And he's a pretty good character. I really had a lot of fun with him before his murder. He, too, is not really that present, as he's murdered pretty early into the novel, much earlier than I had remembered. We do know a lot more about his personality, which plays into his murder. We know he's a good friend to Sir Charles. I'm not sure if there's any, like, a real indication he either intends to have Sir Charles committed or would like spill the beans about his first wife. Although again, I think this is more about Sir Charles than it does Doctor Strange, who Doctor Strange definitely one of the best victims in a Christie novel. And Mrs. De Rush Bridger is just there. We never meet her. I'm not sure her death was necessary. I like the idea that she was murdered not because she knew something, but because she didn't know anything. Christy would use that twist much better in future novels. I won't say which. I'm not sure her death like really added anything to like the puzzle here, but it was fun and clever nonetheless. The mechanics of her death are not too convincing and seem rather convenient. And her revealing that she knew nothing, which if she would have said if Poirot met with her. I don't think that would have been like that detrimental to Sir Charles as everyone in the book seems to think it would be. Like, I don't know what the implication there would have been. Meg, real name Hermione Lytton Gore, is another Christie's plucky young adventure seeking women, of which Tuppence is probably the most famous of. But I find Egg to be like one of the less interesting and less well done versions of this character. She's probably more active in the investigation than many of others in her archetype, you know, besides Tuppence, but she's not the smartest. I mean, she's blinded by Sir Charles at every opportunity. She's not good at investigating, which, I mean, that's part of her character. And she has this dislike of Poirot because he's a better detective than she is, and he's taking away from Sir Charles's big moments, and it's a fine character. I think there are more interesting characters in her type, like Tuppence, like Lucy Isles Barrow from 450 from Paddington, or even even like Lynn Marchmont from Taken at the Flood. Normally Christy has these characters come out on top, and I guess Egg does, but it's, it's just harder to root for her than it is for the others. I think this is an intentional depiction, though I'm not really sure why. Her mother, Lady Mary Lytton Gore, is a good character. Unfortunately, we don't see a lot of her. I mean, she's the typical like older person frowning about what young people are doing. But unlike most of these characters Chris in Christie novels, she's a sympathetic figure. Typically, Christie makes fools of these like old fogies, but she makes Lady Mary very sympathetic. Lady Mary is still wrong. I mean, she wants Egg to marry Sir Charles and not Manders, which is the incorrect choice. But Lady Mary isn't dunked on like uh, Miss Van Schoyle from Death on the Nile, for instance. And Lady Mary's backstory of having married the wrong man who was a terrible husband and left her penniless is a good one and is emphasized in the decisions she makes, even though those decisions are still wrong. And maybe she's anti-Semitic or maybe not, but she's suspicious of Manders and his ideas, which isn't a particularly good look to have nowadays, but wouldn't have been seen as such at the time of publication. Captain Freddie Dakers is one of the more forgettable Christie characters. He's a missed opportunity, I think. He's an alcoholic, a gambler, and former jockey, and he did something in his past. We don't know what. We're never told. It's very vague. And whenever he's on the page, he's not, like, contributing much of anything. He does provide, like, one or two minor red herrings that lead nowhere and aren't interesting, and he complains about, you know, Doctor Strange and Mrs. Dakers wanting him to go to rehab for drinking. And I think there could have been more here, but but Christie chooses to ignore him. 
His wife, Cynthia Dakers, is a little bit more interesting. She has a few more things going on with her, but still, like, nothing too exciting. She owns Ambrosine, the fashion house, and is very popular and very good at her job in the business sense, but I mean, she has no money. <laughs> She's heavily indebted. And we're told she has a mean temper and controls her husband, but we never see any of that. She's really, like, the only one of these, like, barely suspects to have, like, an actual motive to murder Doctor Strange because she may or may not have borrowed money from him. But this, too, like, really goes nowhere and isn't given much page time. Oliver Manders is another type of character we see a lot of from Christy, the handsome young man who has communistic tendencies. And like the others, Christy depicts Manders as something like exploring different philosophies as opposed to, like, being, like, a militant communist He's good-hearted, though misunderstood. We get constant references to him being Jewish. Every time he appears, we get the reminder he's Jewish. It never like really gets into like gross anti-Semitism, but the amount of times it's referenced is odd and is a choice. His beliefs in communism and Judaism are really the main reasons why he becomes the main suspect. He argued with Reverend Babington, and it's just very clear he didn't do it. It's very clearly the red herring decoy, and Sir Charles uses him as an easy easy scapegoat trying to frame him with newspaper clippings about nicotine poisoning and telling you know to show up at strange's party uh, he's a very clear red herring which i easily saw through again he's one of like the less good versions of his character type not a bad character overall i always confuse him with oliver mellers who is you know the gameskeeper and lady chatterley's lover i keep getting them mixed up i actually had recorded this calling him oliver mellers and had to re-record it Angela Sutcliffe is probably the biggest dud in the book. I mean, she really serves no purpose other than being part of the very few minor red herring moments that lead nowhere. She once loved Sir Charles, but now they're friends. I mean, she hates Egg, but nothing is ever done with this. I and mean, she really just isn't important at all, despite her technically being a suspect, but she's not convincing in that role at all. The fact that she's cut from the Suchet adaptation is a pretty clear indicator of her role in this book. Her absence is not felt. Margaret Babington, the Reverend's wife, is a fairly decent, though unimportant, character. Her main role is to provide backstory for her husband, which isn't important. But I think Christy does something interesting with her. There's actually quite a bit of grief coming from her. And we don't get a lot of this sort of content, really, from any mystery author. She's very appreciative when Egg comes to visit her because she's alone. Her husband is dead and her children are all grown and living elsewhere. It's a nice touching scene that's not heavy handed, but you really do feel the emotions coming from her as this lonely widow. She's not really a suspect as she is, doesn't attend Sir uh, Doctor Strange's party, and she's largely like out of the picture after the first act until she reappears towards the end of the book. Muriel Willis slash Anthony Astor is probably the second best character in the novel. She's really the only character outside of that main investigative group who has any sort of useful content. I've always liked her descriptive appearance as this rather like milk toast woman who, quote, looks like a nursery governess, unquote. But that outward appearance hides a shrewd mind and her plays are actually extremely clever and witty as is she. Unfortunately, we're just told that and are never really shown that, but she is a very intelligent woman in the way she recognizes Ellis's hands as Sir Charles's hands and not for the Australian-shaped birthmark on them. Most people would have noticed the birthmark, but not the hands themselves. And she gets caught snooping around quite a bit. I think it's a shame Christy sidelined her instead of including her as part of Poirot's team. And she's far more interesting than like Egg or, you know, Sir Charles. Oh, not Sir Charles, but even like a Poirot or a Mr. Satterthwaite. The final character discussed is Miss Violet Milray, who is, again, a type of character we see a lot in detective fiction, the middle-aged spinster employee of the handsome single rich man who is, of course, in love with her employer. It's so common. And Miss Milray doesn't like really stand out in that group of characters, but she does have some moments. I like how Poirot follows her at the end of the novel as she's about to smash the poison-making equipment. It sets her up as an accomplice and possible murderer, a decent piece of misdirection. Miss Milray is the best sort of red herring slash decoy suspect we have, not only because of the poison, but she does appear to be like running the party, i.e., you know, the murderer is the one who has to be in control so certain things can happen. 
she's the only person who actually knows the Babingtons somewhat well. Christy never really like elevates her to prime suspect, which is why I say she's a decoy and not a true red herring. A red herring suspect is one who is pushed in our face and turns out to be the killer and turns out not to be the killer, excuse me. But a decoy suspect is a character who is more like subtly implicated and like the kind of person an average reader would most likely avoid would suspect because they would avoid the obvious and look for someone less clearly implicated but like still attached to some clues however i do wish christy went harder here as a lot of the suspicion on her appears to be incidental and not actually like intentional on christy's part because she doesn't like really own it and that's it for this video let me know in the comments what you think of three act tragedy I think it's a second tier, Christy. It's a lot of fun, but does fall apart a bit on inspection. Next week, I will be discussing And Then There Were None Adaptations. I was going to rank them, but some time ago, a viewer suggested I discuss them rather than rank them. And I think that's the better approach. If you want to catch up on your adaptations of this classic, these are the ones I'm going to discuss. Agatha Christie's original stage play, the 1945 American film, the 1965 British film, the 1974 British film, the 1989 British film, the 1959 American TV movie, the 2015 BBC miniseries, the 2005 PC video game, and two foreign language adaptations, the 1987 Soviet film, I won't try to pronounce that name, and the 2020 French miniseries called Ils et Tant D. And there are a lot of other adaptations, especially foreign language ones, but these are the ones I chose for this video, so stay tuned for that. Until next time, Mystery Files.